This video was made possible through the help of generous donations from viewers like you. Thank you. 20 something years ago, a 20 year old sang like this. Today, a 20 something year old sings like this. Ever happened to me? Ever happened to me? Ever happened to me? Why did I pull it, jigger, pull it, jigger, pull it, jigger, boom? I am not saying that the new girls don't sound good, nor am I saying that they don't make great music. But what I am saying is that there has been a change in the quality and standard of singing across all a 20 year old sounding like this. <laughs> To now sounding like this. Tuesday and Wednesday, Thursday and Friday, I just keep them satisfied. Well, the answer is actually pretty simple. Practice. It takes 10,000 hours to be considered an expert or a master at a task. The old school girls achieved their 10,000 hours before they even thought about touching a major stage. And they would get those hours one or two ways school and church there was a time when art was deeply integrated in american culture and everyday life in 1935 president franklin delano roosevelt enacted the works in progress act and in turn created the federal music act what this act did was put many artists to work to help rebuild the economy after the great depression so in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, you could go to the community center in your neighborhood and see an opera put on for free, or a symphony, or an art installation. And even better, under the Works in Progress Act, music education was made free and accessible to the public. So just imagine going into your local community center and getting a free voice or piano lesson from a professional. Again? One, two. And because of the Federal Music Act, music also became a part of the public school learning curriculum. So students in public school systems were learning how to sing, read, write, and compose music from a trained music professional. Every morning, every Monday through Friday, every morning there was a class from 9 o'clock to 10.30. So that meant that I had for four years, four years, a voice lesson five days a week, plus my voice lesson on Saturday, six days a week. Who ever heard of that? That doesn't, that doesn't happen these days. As a part of her school curriculum, Grace Bumber got a one and a half hour voice lesson every day. So let's do some math. One and a half hours a day times five days a week, that's seven and a half hours. There are four weeks in a year. That's 30 hours a month. A school year lasts approximately nine months. That's 270 hours a school year. She did this for four years, so that it's 1,080 hours of practice. Not to mention, Grace Bumbry and singers like Phyllis Hyman were also a part of their school choirs and choruses. <laughs> Many years ago, school choir and chorus was just as competitive and actively funded like school sports. These choirs and choruses would compete around the countries against each other for trophies and prizes. The market for this was so strong that many of these choirs and choruses would also cut records. And that's where you'll find singers such as Martha Wash making their earliest recordings. But to do school choir and chorus also requires more practice. So, say for instance, you're practicing with your choir two hours a day, four days a week. That's an additional eight hours of practice a week, which means that's 32 hours a month, 
288 hours for a school year at an extra 1,440 hours that you've gotten over your school career. So you have your 1,080 hours from music class, your 1,152 hours from high school chorus class. So by the time you get your diploma, you have gotten over 2,000 hours of training and development for free. And this doesn't even take into account the students who are practicing at home. The other way singers would acquire their hours would be through church. A traditional church music training is on par with a music education. And here's how. When Europeans brought Africans over through slavery, they introduced them to Christianity and the music of the European church, which by nature is classical. So if you listen to traditional gospel music, at its root, you will see and hear that the music and techniques of gospel and classical music are very similar. I'm just the time I need. In these churches, there was someone called a minister or a director of music. An example of this would be Sissy Houston or Maddie Moss Clark. This person was usually from a music education background and was in charge of picking all the music that would be sang in the church. In addition to this, they would work with choir members on vocal technique and also piano and music theory to get the Sunday music right. So you have your singers like Aretha Franklin and the Clark sisters who acquired thousands of hours of musical training because they were in church literally from birth. So you have your school girls and your church girls. And then you have your singers such as Leona Mitchell and Dionne Warwick who sang in both school and church. That's hours and hours of training. But let's also remember the context of the times. There was no social media, so these girls had very little distractions. But also, this is the early to mid 20th century we're talking about. So no matter a family's social economic status, many of them kept a musical instrument in the house because it was through music that many families bonded. Just think about how many singing families were cutting records together in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. I believe, I believe, I believe. Or remember when kids played outside and would make up songs to hopscotch and jump rope too. The girls were practicing and putting in hours when they didn't even know it. So what happened? Well, it's pretty simple. The girls just aren't getting their hours anymore. In the late 70s and early 80s, under President Ronald Reagan, the government began defunding art education and public school systems. And that is why programs such as the Save the Music campaigns were created. And over the past two to three decades, younger generations of people have been steadily stepping away from the church. So the two places that bred musicians the most have now been compromised greatly. But another important thing to remember is that once upon a time, there were a lot more careers available in music. A typical career path for a singer would be they start in a group or a band, sing background, 
then graduate to a solo career. Those years of band and background singing were more and more hours of training. And up until around the 1990s or so, you can make a good, honest, sustainable living in music without being a superstar. People the think, away. they always think it's sudden, don't they? <laughs> but it's not o sudden Overnight at all. success. No, of course it's not. I've been working in nightclubs uh, in Florida for a few years, and then, then to New York, and getting into jingles by accident. A lot of it is by accident. There is a market for people who sing and wrote jingles for big products and brands. Your, uh, your voice is in a lot of commercials now. Mm-hmm. Tell them some of them they would recognize. Uh, Y'all know the Reebok spot. You got to play like you don't need money. Play like you never get hurt. You got to play. You could be a demo singer, singing demos for big name artists. Well, like I used to demo a lot of records and there was a club beat that came on and two guys were like, oh, um, here's some lyrics. You know, at the time I was getting paid 150 as a demo. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, he said to me, oh, if you put this demo down and I don't have a melody, but if you make these lyrics work, I'll give you $300. So I was like, 300? Okay, focus. Right. <laughs> and one of the best things you could do was have your own club act. Having your own club act at a local supper or dining club was a very respectable career. But sooner or later, there has got to come a time when you got to do right, yo. Oh, I want to do right. And it was also how many singers would get discovered and get their first record deals. releasing her debut album, Whitney Houston covered this entire gamut. She sang jingles. Tonight is unmistakably stick and dance. She sang demos. She did background work. And she did a club act before she released her first record. That is hours and hours of private training and development that the current crop of singers no longer are able to get because these careers are no longer really available. But even after signing a record deal, a singer was still not put on stage immediately. There was a thing called artist development. So at labels such as Motown and Columbia Records, Artists were enrolled in singing, dancing, and acting lessons to make sure they were well-rounded performers before it was time for them to be presented to the public. Maurice King was our musical director at the time. He said, I got two things that'll help you, okay? First of all, you gotta be aware of the, the cold kick. That's why you see me with this on, right. even though it's hot outside. You know, you gotta keep your vocal cords warm. Right. And he, he told me for the first time, your top note is a B flat in your natural voice. Right. If you go above that too many times, you won't have voice. Right. And that's what I do now. I stay in my key. Artist development is no longer present in today's music industry. So you have singers who are being taken straight from Instagram and put on the Grammy stage. They are being expected to do the same work without the same preparation. And the result is what we hear today. The homogenization of sounds in mainstream music, girls not being able to replicate what's on the record, running into premature vocal issues, but most importantly, not being prepared for the rigors and demands of the music industry and ready to leave after the release of their first single. So now what can I do? I am not saying that one generation of singers and musicians is better than the other, but what I am saying is that today's singers and musicians are a direct reflection of how life and politics impact art. Thanks for watching. I hope you learned something. Until next time.